Ladies and gentlemen, we are very, very honored today to have a very distinguished panel. Uh, I'll just very briefly uh, introduce them, uh, and then I'll ask uh, Tharman to get started. But uh, the very distinguished panelists we have today include uh, Mr. Tharman Shanmugratnam, who's the senior minister in Singapore, Ms. Joe Tyndall, director, the Environment Directorate at the OECD, Professor Nicholas Stern from the London School of Economics, Sri Nitin Prasad, who's the chairman of Shell India, and Dr. Al Ketbi, who's the president of the Emirates Policy Center. So an extraordinarily distinguished uh, group uh, that we have here, uh, who I think will shed uh, light on a number of the challenges and opportunities confronting uh, the world right now with respect to a just transition. Uh, let me first turn to uh, my good friend Tharman, uh, and the question I'd like to pose to him is, what are the financing requirements for this just green transition, and uh, how, do you, how do you think that the world can actually uh, deal with these financing challenges and opportunities we have? Over to you, Tharman. Thank, no, thank you, Jayat. I think the two things that um, have to guide all that we do on climate transition and financing of that transition is to bear in mind urgency, scale, and opportunity. We are way behind in this race. We are way behind. Uh, even in this decade, we are way behind in achieving 2030 targets in virtually every region of the world. So we must have a sense of urgency. We have to get moving. And we have to get moving in imperfect ways and not let the perfect be the enemy of what is urgent and necessary. But think of it as opportunity. Because this is actually an opportunity for growth and equity that we haven't seen in decades. Whichever way you look at it, whether it's the $1 trillion that Nick Stern and Vera Songwei have identified as necessary for the developing economy, excluding China, in, from now until 2030, per year $1 trillion, or whether it's the larger $3 to $9 trillion that we have to invest in globally for the energy transition, all the way to 2050. Those numbers sound large, but it's actually about investing in growth for economic returns. The rough calculations, I mean, there are sophisticated calculations. The IMF, the IEA, and others have, have modeled this, and they show a very significant increment to global growth, and particularly an increment to growth in the developing world. But even the rough back of the envelope calculations coming out of this significant new investment in our economies suggest that we, are, we have the opportunity of opening up a whole new phase of growth and more inclusive growth. More inclusive, obviously, for future generations because it's about keeping the planet safe for humanity, but it's also more inclusive today because it means connecting what? almost a half a billion people who still don't have electricity globally, another half a billion people who don't have clean cooking methods globally. And it's about new jobs. It's about new regions, because typically in large countries, the places with the sun, the wind, and the water are not the capital cities. They're not even the major cities. They're very often in the boondocks. So it's about a whole new opportunity for more inclusive regional growth within countries. So think of it as growth and equity opportunities on a scale that we haven't seen in decades. Think of it also in, in terms of technologies and innovation. Because the most important solutions in getting to 2050, getting to net zero, involve investment in technologies that are either proven but do not yet have scale, or technologies that are not yet proven, but are promising. Not yet have scale, but mature. You can think of electric vehicles, technology is proven, but we don't have the charging infrastructure. It requires the public sector to get involved, public-private partnerships. You need the charging infrastructure to get that scale and to drive down the costs. Promising and not yet proven, carbon capture and storage, green hydrogen, very promising, but we've got to invest. And here, too, we need public-private partnerships. So when we think about it all, 
whether it's a trillion dollars for the developing world or three trillion dollars minimum globally for the next 30 years, the numbers sound big, but they're actually very small. The global capital market is about $250 trillion, growing by more than three to five trillion dollars per year. It's all about how we channel resources, how we incentivize capital. And incentivizing capital for this whole new opportunity means a new era of public-private partnerships, a new era of sharing risks in an appropriate way, and sharing returns. So it's a real opportunity. It's not about financial engineering at the end of the day. It's about institutional reform. It's about a whole new era of partnerships between the public and private sectors, between the global north and the global south, to unlock growth and to spur changes and reforms that provide for equity, equity in every society. Thank you very much, Tharman. And I think you have very eloquently laid out uh, my headline, which is what I always say, net zero is net positive. So net zero is net positive. I think you laid that out very eloquently. Uh, and of course, now we should uh, turn to Nick. Uh, Nick, you've just heard, uh, you know, Sumanji set the stage. You've heard Tharman lay out very eloquently as to how big an opportunity it is. Now, if you were Ajay Banga, if you, if you were Ajay Banga just taking over the World Bank, what would you do? Thank you. Um, the, he's been nominated. He hasn't yet been appointed, of course. But, the, uh, but I actually hope he will be appointed. The, you'd start with what is it for? You know, what is the purpose? Matlab kya hai? And you would say, I hope, that this is about poverty, particularly as expressed through the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, within that, climate. Because in 2015, the world set its agenda through the SDGs and Paris. It's an agreed global agenda, and it's a wise global agenda. You start with the, what it is that you're trying to do. And as soon as you put it that way, you recognize that we now have a renewed mandate for the MDBs as a whole, particularly for the World Bank. World Bank was about rebuilding infrastructure at that time, particularly in Europe, after the Second World War, a massive investment challenge. We now have an even bigger investment challenge to respond to those objectives. Um, and, uh, Tarman has illustrated some numbers, um, working particularly with Amar Bhattacharya, Vera Songwe and I chaired a group which described the climate part of the uh, investment challenge, nested of course within the overall sustainable development goal uh, story, as requiring by um, uh, 2030 investments in emerging markets and developing economies outside China uh, around $2.4 trillion a year, 1.4 trillion of that was the energy transition. And then, of course, you've got the critically important subjects of adaptation, resilience, loss and damage, and natural capital, which formed the other trillion. So that's the investments that need financing. So how do you finance those investments? And particularly, how do you encourage those investments to get done through the right kind of investment climate, incentives, country platforms, and so on? So that's a logical deduction from the goals that the world has set out, which should be the goals for the World Bank, particularly the 2015 uh, agenda. Now, that is not going to be easy. You're going to have macro problems, problems around the cost of capital, supply chain uh, issues, dislocation and the trust transition. Those are all difficulties. But we have to overcome those difficulties. We cannot use them as an argument to say, well, it's all a bit difficult, we'll take a bit more time. That is the most unrealistic of all, because taking more time puts the world in huge je jeopardy. We're already seeing just next door in Pakistan one example. We've seen the examples across the world. At 1.1, we risk at the moment 2.5 or more and that would be absolutely transformative. We haven't been at three degrees centigrade for around three million years. And then sea level is just one example with 10 to 20 meters higher than now. Imagine that from the perspective of Bangladesh. 
This is a story where the most unrealistic position of all, the most reckless position of all, is delay. So we must recognize the difficulties. We must work to overcome the difficulties, as Tarman has been describing. But we should not use those as examples, as arguments for uh, delay. I totally agree with, uh, with Tarman that this is the growth and development story of the 21st century. You're investing in low-cost activities already across 30% of the world's emissions. The clean is cheaper than the dirty. By the end of this um, decade, that could be 65, 70%. So we'll be investing in cheaper areas and where the innovation is particularly strong. A big part of that will be energy efficiency and resource efficiency more generally. Efficiency is productivity, productivity is growth. Not killing people on a massive scale. In my own country, the UK, which is, some people might think is clean, well, we kill 35,000 a year from air pollution, most of it from burning fossil fuel. We kill 1,700 in road accidents, 5%. We, so you get good health is higher productivity. For all these reasons, and of course the investment itself, if you increase the investment rate, you'd expect to increase the growth rate, the productivity. This is the growth story, but it's tough. You have to invest a lot to get there, but those are enormously valuable investments. And at the same time, of course, we have to recognize that the urgency is not just about reducing emissions. The urgency is also about adaptation and resilience on a major scale and tackling loss and damage. What are the finance implications of this? Broadly, five sources of finance have to come together. Domestic private and domestic public. External private multilateral development banks particularly, and concessional funds. Those five have to come together. So when we talk about one trillion in external finance being necessary as a flow uh, for these climate-related investments within, of course, development, by 2030, we're not talking about one pot. We're talking about those three external sources, external, private, MDBs, and concessional, coming together to complement and work with domestic public and domestic uh, private. That's the challenge. And so that one trillion is not the old hundred billion, it's very different. It's a deductive story, what you need to get the job done that we have to do if we're not to destroy ourselves, that we have to do if we're to have the sustainable development goals overcome poverty on a sustainable basis. So that's the story. Actually, it, it's remarkable that now, I think, perhaps much more clearly than when the World Bank was established in uh, the uh, second half of the 40s, we actually have a fairly clear view of what it is that we have to do. And we have something which we didn't have then. We have a deadline. The deadline isn't the impatience of Tarman and Nick or Giant. The deadline is in the physics, and you can't negotiate uh, with it. If you think that that deadline is unreal, if you think those risks are small, please publish your results immediately. I know the editor of Nature very well. They would be very happy to publish these new results that you have. The science is very clear and strong. Unless we meet these deadlines, we are in deep, deep trouble. Thank you, Nick, for uh, really, really making sure that Ajay Banga gets moving very quickly on climate finance. You made that case very well. Uh, let me now turn to Joe. Uh, Joe, what do you think the OECD can do, particularly through the Inclusive Forum for Carbon Mitigation Approaches, which goes to the heart of what uh, both Harman and Nick are talking about? Thanks for that. And uh, I guess what I'm going to, to focus on is more the policy side, which needs to go together very, very closely with the, uh, the finance and investment side. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I agree completely. The urgency is such that it's, uh, we haven't got the luxury of time for linear or incremental change. We really have to ramp things up uh, and accelerate. And uh, what is becoming obvious is that uh, um, back in the past, uh, climate change was the preserve of environmental uh, ministries off to one side. But what is happening now is that climate change is being mainstreamed um, because we know we have to make changes not only in the energy sector, but across the whole uh, economy. 
and for many governments, this is uncharted waters, designing and developing policies. And what's happened as a result of the Paris Agreement, uh, being a bottom-up sort of approach, is you've got a vast diversity uh, of mitigation approaches, both price-based and non-price-based. So for the OECD, um, on the 9th of February, we launched the Inclusive Forum on Carbon Mitigation Approaches, the IFCMA, uh, with 104 countries uh, present uh, and uh, um, a really great discussion. But it's about how can we best cooperate to accelerate and maximise mitigation uh, of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and, and taking into account that, that huge diversity of, of approaches. We're about trying to support uh, and complement the UNFCCC, which maintains the primacy um, of uh, the approach on, on climate change. Uh, and we're involving both OECD members and partners on an equal footing basis. So there are two stages to this. First of all, it's about collecting and collating the data that's there um, of the policy instruments and policy packages uh, that governments have designed and implemented to fulfil their nationally determined uh, uh, contributions under the Paris Agreement. Mapping those uh, approaches against emissions bases and trying to fill in as many gaps as possible through verification back with governments. Second phase is to use modelling. Uh, a range of economic modelling tools to estimate the effectiveness uh, of the approaches in, in reducing emissions. And the third, and, and I think almost the most important part of this, is to create a forum uh, for peer exchange so that, that governments can showcase the uh, um, approaches they have designed and implement, but also use uh, um, peer learning to uh, consider how uh, and whether approaches other countries have taken and can be adopted or adapted by them to suit uh, their own particular circumstances. So really what we want to achieve is, is not a ranking or creating some sort of carbon price equivalent because we know there are price-based and non-price-based approaches being used around the world. We are looking to ensure uh, the collective reductions uh, um, of emissions rather than just kind of shifting them from one parts, part of the world to, the, to another and to encourage a race to the top um, with, with countries and governments uh, looking to quickly take on board um, the best policy options to uh, fulfil the commitments they've made under the Paris Agreement and hopefully enhance their ambition uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Joe. So turning from one uh, multilateral fora to another, which is COP, uh, Dr. El Kitbi, uh, the UAE is going to be hosting COP28. Uh, you all are uh, in a very uh, important uh, position to drive and shape the agenda. What do you see as being the priorities for COP28? Thank you for that. <clears throat> I am the black sheep in this panel. I, I am more on geopolitics. And, and first, I, before to go to COP, I have a comment on the issue of the uh, energy transition and, and the climate change and, and the responsibility of everybody about that. Now, hearing that the solution and the policies where does the South fit in this in terms that they have limited resources? What is the responsibility of the North? I mean, can how the electric um, uh, cars, whatever, how can that be applied in uh, rural uh, areas, in Africa, in India, in Egypt, wherever it is? Where is the more pollution is coming uh, there? This is the responsibility. The solution should be also there. Also, the accusation of the countries of the producing uh, energy, they are the source of that uh, problem. This is also is not fair. Those whom they are consuming that, whom they are, have industry of that, they are also responsible for that. Maybe the responsibility now, what UAE also and others try to do to reach a uh, decarbonization uh, energy by uh, 200 uh, to, to zero 
50 or uh, 30 for UAE. And uh, it's almost now UAE is pioneer in that. But I mean, without having this perspective uh, from both north and, and, and south and sharing that, and this is bring us to, to, uh, to COP. UAE is preparing very well. First, you have to know that also being an uh, oil producer country, it's not an easy also. You have been accused that why you are hosting COP, okay? And many criticism against UAE and criticism for the head of the COP because he is also head of the ADNOC, the energy producer uh, uh, company. But it shows that this is a small country, uh, responsible about uh, sharing with others the responsibility about a clean uh, planet, uh, uh, a clean uh, energy. But also we inherited from the previous COPs, many issues has not been uh, solved. Which I, well, some of them which I mentioned the responsibilities, the cost and losses, not yet, okay, between uh, both. But also UAE preparing to include all, everybody, the civil society, the youth, the uh, think tanks, the uh, women, because believing that everybody in this planet has a share of responsibility and a homework to do in terms of moving in the energy transition and uh, a clean uh, energy. There are food security, one of the issues which we are facing. Also, I, I have something to, to raise here. We have problem after uh, Ukrainian war that we were moving towards climate change and energy transition and we are backward for more Fossil, uh, fossil energy that we have these industries, uh, countries looking for cool and so, so also it shows and also asking for producing country, oil producing to pump more oil and there was, and all of you, you know about what happened in Arabic. So also we have dilemma between geopolitics and geo economy. So this is also an area should be solved in that uh, uh, issue. Uh, our minister, uh, Reem al-Hashimi, mentioned the responsibility. I think, you, you know, we hosted uh, Expo and we were so successful and UAE does not take anything if uh, she is not sure that it will handle it well, it have a successful agenda, very, very successful agenda. I am part of that with uh, responsibility of think tanks, taking, and I mean my, my center, and taking uh, how also think tank will view that and how will help uh, in, in the policies. It's not only health policies. We need many policies, each in, in uh, awareness policies, okay, uh, those all activists also for a clean environment, they need only not criticizing to give uh, a policies how, how to reach. And I will uh, end by again emphasizing on the responsibility of the South towards, uh, sorry, the, the North toward the South. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Kedby. Uh, may I now ask uh, Nitin, who represents one of the global oil majors, what is Shell doing to get the world to net zero? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jayant. Uh, as a Shell, we've always uh, embedded in our values and our purpose uh, the sense of our role in society and the positive contribution that we would like to come back and make. Now, as a global MNC, we clearly have perspectives from the global south as well as the global north. Right? Um, and we have to come back and balance those perspectives and see how do we come back and provision and provide energy in an affordable, competitive sense, yet continue to progress aggressively uh, in, on our climate change and, uh, and the energy transition as we move forward. 
we as Shell have come back and, and broken that up into two different parts. And, and for us, the first part is uh, being very aggressive in terms of our own emissions and that the erstwhile scope one and scope two and announce uh, clearly that we will reduce by 50% by 2030 our own emissions. So this is us producing oil and gas much more efficiently. Uh, and we're well on our way. We, we have uh, also stated that we are 18% uh, reductions as of now compared to 2016 uh, baseline. But the bigger challenge, of course, is, is uh, for us is on scope three, which accounts for 88% of the emissions uh, that's associated with our business, which is the emissions from the customers and consumers as they use our products going forward. And this has led us to come back and accelerate into taking a look at a, a plethora of clean energy solutions and services. Uh, we believe very much in the net profit uh, concept. Um, and therefore, it does mean that we take a look at renewables, bio, CCUS, hydrogen, uh, nature-based solutions, and other sort of associated services as we go forward. And we choose to do this in, in a sectoral sense, working with customers uh, and, and working backwards. But I would sort of come back and, and only make this comment that, you know, that we work very closely with a large number of customers uh, all over the world. Um, and given our scope three ambitions and, and our challenges to come back and reduce this, we have a very clear line of sight into many different corporates. And there are many corporates who are willing to come back and play their part in a much more aggressive sense in terms of accelerating the energy transition. But these solutions are not simple. Um, you know, while we, while we are, are aggressive in terms of what we need to come back and do, scaling and deploying these solutions is going to require a lot of work in terms of collaboration, in terms of coalitions, and how do we come and build the, the institutional frameworks, but also the partnerships uh, across geographical boundaries, but also within the countries uh, from a range of different stakeholders. Thank you very much, Nitin. What I'd like to now request from uh, the panelists is a rapid fire round, maybe a minute or two. Uh, I'll ask uh, some quick questions. Uh, and then once we finish, we'll have a chance to have the audience ask us two or three questions as well. So a rapid fire round, Tharman, you're on first. What can Singapore do to be a global hub for climate finance? I think what can Singapore do to promote uh, climate finance, working in partnership with everyone else? I think the key thing is to realize that climate finance is not just about financing green. In fact, it's not even primarily about financing green. It's about financing transition of brown to green. Suman had mentioned earlier on that if you look at Asia, if you look at the developing world, a very large part of energy is fossil fuel based. And that means each industry each type of economic activity is also fossil fuel based. How do we achieve a transition in sources of energy and a transition in per capita energy consumption that will get us to net zero eventually? It won't be achieved if we simply stop investing in brown and look for opportunities in green. To achieve it at scale, we've got to help brown become grey and grey become green. And that orientation in investment, in finance, and in public-private partnerships has to guide us. Look at every industry and find ways of making it more sustainable, more circular. And the opportunities are there. The opportunities are there in agriculture, which is, by the way, a greatly neglected area because we often think of industry. Today's agricultural practices are grossly inefficient. They are water inefficient and they are energy inefficient. And we are incentivizing that. Because globally, we are subsidizing energy in agriculture, which leads to more pumping of groundwater, depleting the aquifers, and it's unsustainable. And what's happening is that because water is now getting more sparse in the soil, in the ground, in the forests, these natural ecosystems are no longer carbon sinks. They're becoming carbon emitters, which is going to accelerate the pace of climate change. So we have to think about every sector, and in agriculture, which is often neglected, the opportunities to invest in precision irrigation, to invest in more drought-resistant crops and farming, are going to have payoffs for the farmer, because of higher yields, higher incomes, payoffs for water, making it more sustainable, payoffs for climate. So every sector has, has to go through a transition and we have to avoid thinking of the world and the economy in binary terms of brown versus green. We have to avoid sort of 
badgering people to get out of brown. We've got to badger them to make brown less brown and grey and eventually make it green. Thank you, Tarman. Uh, Nick, so now you've told us what Ajay Banga should do. Can you tell us what the IMF should do? I'll try. Um, the, the challenge is to <clears throat> bring down the cost of capital so that these investments can be financed. Jayant, you should say something. You know more about <laughs> the cost of capital, blended finance, and so on than most people uh, around. Um, you have ex exchange rate risk and macro risk. You have policy risk and you have the credit risk of the counterparties. And you have to tackle all those risks if you're going to bring down the cost of capital. And of course, the IMF is particularly, could be particularly helpful around the major debt, <clears throat> exchange rate, and uh, country risks uh, uh, of the macro kind. And so many of the countries of the uh, developing world, uh, as a result <clears throat> um, of particularly of these two crises of um, uh, the war in, in, in Ukraine and COVID, are in very difficult macro positions. So I think it's a very big task for the IMF and, of course, uh, the, <clears throat> the, particularly the rich countries, in bringing down that debt. And that's a major challenge, which will affect the cost of capital for those uh, countries. I think there's more, more they can do with the uh, SDRs, and those could be used in a very valuable way to leverage concessional capital. Because we have to recognize, if you look at the different tasks, you know, all the way from the massive scale up in renewable generation and grids and so on that we need, all the way through to natural capital and loss and damage, you're going to need very different combinations of the sources of five sources of capital that I described. And you're going to need a lot of concessional capital, particularly around loss and damage. And there's one thing to have a pot which is labeled loss and damage. It's another thing to have something inside that pot that can be used for loss and damage. And we really have to press very hard. And that's a big uh, challenge for COP28. And uh, I'm privileged to be able to help uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sultan in, in that whole process. But that's a, a major uh, challenge uh, as well. So I think the IMF, all the way through from the big country risk and debt challenges, through to the generation of um, concessional capital, has a tremendous role to play in this big challenge of finding the right combinations of different sources of funds for the particular challenges that we have. And it's not just one challenge, it's all the way through from the, the mitigation right the way through to the loss and damage and natural capital. And different combinations are necessary, and I think the IMF can be very good here. But I wanted to finish by saluting what Chris, Kristalina Georgieva's leadership on all this. She's uh, really building on what Christine Lagarde did. Um, those two managing directors really have taken the IMF in a good direction, but there's lots, lots more for them to do. Thank you very much. And as you know, Nick, I've argued that the IMF is very well positioned uh, to bear uh, Global South currency risk, which really drives up our cost of capital by 200 to 400 basis points for sure. Turning to you now, Joe, uh, obviously the OECD is seen as a Global North institution. Can you really help the Global South? Well, actually, uh, it's a bit of a misnomer. There's a bit of the Global South also um, as part of the, the OECD, um, uh, certainly in South America, for example. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, one of the things I wanted to, uh, to talk about was while I said, um, of course, we can't, you know, sort of uh, understate the urgency of the need to get on with things, it's quite clear uh, that um, fossil fuels are going to be with us for a while. The tap is not going to be turned off uh, from one day to the next, um, although war in Ukraine might have um, uh, put a different complexion on that. Um, and financing is the key. So one of the, uh, the programs the OECD has working with the Global South is the Clean Energy Financing and Investment Mobilization Program, CEFIM. Um, and that is about uh, um, finding financing and investment uh, solutions for clean energy transition in an advanced and emerging economies. It's very much um, a case of working collaboratively with uh, different governments to find tailored solutions that uh, um, fit with their particular circumstances. We use dialogue, workshops, 
um, working with policymakers, with the financial sector, with the, the, the industry sector, trying to pull together um, uh, Nick, the, the, the five sources of finance you, you've been talking about, uh, whether this is blended finance, transition finance to deal with hard to abate uh, um, industry and so on, and uh, um, identify the barriers, both in terms of, of um, uh, the, uh, the technology or the situation, but also um, in financing terms. Uh, and then uh, uh, from there develop the most promising opportunities for change, whether that's in energy efficiency, um, in uh, uh, um, renewable energy, new forms of energy like green hydrogen, offshore um, wind and so on, um, and uh, also uh, uh, for um, industry decarbonisation. The, the objective of doing this is to ensure that the countries themselves have a clear roadmap and plan um, and can build a pipeline uh, of, of projects uh, that are going to be capable of, of attracting investment from those various Th Thank you, Joe, sources. because we'll run out of time in a second. Dr. El Kedby. Obviously, the UAE has a lot of petrodollars right now. Can they become climate dollars or green dollars? Is that possible? Yeah, in its, in its um, uh, hydrogen roadmap, uh, that uh, its, its, its policies uh, decision is one of energy mix diversification uh, strategy to net zero target by two, 2050. And one of that, of course, that mix uh, strategy will be, which is, will be launched next week, uh, year, uh, it has similar pillars that uh, covering international uh, cooperation, financing, green fund, and that has been allocated, and uh, Abu Dhabi financial uh, market is working in that by creating and uh, involving many partners for that uh, green firm, research and development, and of course, the hydrogen uh, industry. I have to mention that UAE is pioneer. I mean, this uh, creating masdar, this goes too long in the mid of uh, 2005 when it started UAE, renewable energy. This is coming from an oil producer country, this is shows that uh, UAE has a, a strategy and, and a long uh, sight for how it's going, not being selfish by producing only uh, the energy and not helping the others uh, for a clean energy. Yeah. Thank, you. Th thank you very much. And now final question to the panel, Nitin, uh, very quickly. Do you think carbon capture utilization and storage can really be scaled up to be a solution? Well, I think I don't think it should. I think it, we have to. Uh, we talked about fossil fuels still still being in the mix for for a very long period of time, and and we work, as I mentioned to you, a large number of customers. I can tell you, as we put decarbonization pathways forward, we've been through every single technology, from hydrogen to renewables to everything else. In the end of the day, there is still emissions left over in steel, in cement, in aluminum, in chemicals, in many different sectors. We cannot get to absolute zero. So it is an absolutely part of the, of the infrastructure, the set that's there. And I think uh, we have to sort of see a pathway to scale it up and get there. And, and we increasingly see not just us using our own assets to be deployed as a technology partner, but as a service to customers. And Thank you, Nitin. Thank you. And I'm just being a little uh, quick here because I can see the screens flashing times up. But I do want to leave a few minutes for a couple of questions from the audience. There was a lady there, uh, perhaps you might want to ask your question. If you can just very briefly introduce yourself and just ask a precise pointed question. I'm Louise van Schrijk, I'm from the Netherlands, the Klingenau Institute. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, a question actually to the minister and to Nick Stern and to Joe. And it's a very difficult question, I think, in these contexts to answer. So if it's a very difficult question, it's only directed at Thadman then. <laughs> he does difficult. Well, so my question would be, how do we deal with another sector that has seen a lot of profits in the last years and is likely to see a lot of profits in the future, namely the defense industry? How do we get that sector from 
very, very gray to maybe a bit less gray to greener and, and evolving. And are you also taking that into consideration in your planning to, Th to expand Thank you, the thank you. Talman, please. Just a couple of minutes, please. It's a very interesting question, and I don't feel that I have enough knowledge about the technologies and the manufacturing methods in the defense sector to answer it with confidence. Um, but whether it's defense, steel, cement, the other needle-moving opportunities in the next two decades, we've got to get involved in public-private partnerships to develop the technologies, make them commercially viable, and scale them up. So I don't have a precise answer on defense, but it's not just defense. There are a few sectors which are considered hard to abate, as Nitin was saying. But hard to abate is not impossible to abate. We've got to do something. And there's some very exciting work being done now on both cement and steel, which together are quite a significant component of global carbon emissions, just as an example. We've got to do it, we've got to scale it up. And to take um, uh, my colleague from UAE's point, the innovations aren't all going to come from the global north, by the way. There's some very interesting innovations in the global south. And if you look at it historically, we, we've been neglected this. Just remember, the World Bank in 1961 invested in bullet trains in Japan. It was new. It was actually not a, it wasn't part of the global north at the time. And it became a global model. So we have to raise our ambitions in the developing world. We've got the science, we've got the engineers, we've got the wherewithal, the innovation wherewithal. Raise our ambitions. This is going to be a learning game in every direction. Thank you, Tarman. The gentleman there, and the brown, and then we'll take one final question from the lady there. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm Jean-Pascal Van Ipersel, a climate scientist from Belgium, former IPCC vice chair. Uh, the IPCC will soon can find... You, can you tell us whom you're directing the question to? Listen, I'll ask for a very short, for a very short answer, so as many as possible. Well, then we'll, we'll, ask, we'll ask Nick then. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the question is the following. The IPCC will soon start its, its seven assessment cycle. Uh, the, the sixth assessment cycle will be closed very soon. My question is, what are your dreams uh, about the uh, future of IPCC so that, so that it would be even more policy relevant or even more useful uh, for policy makers and decision makers at all levels in the world? Thank you. Nick, please. Yeah, I, I, I've got a very direct answer to that question, is to try to bring the scientists and the economic policy makers much closer together and the economic modelers and analysis much closer together. A big part of the economic analysis of climate change writes down damages associated with climate change which are absurd, absurdly low when you look at the climate science. So that is the challenge. I think it's perfectly feasible and actually we've got a meeting um, where the head of the IPCC is coming at the Royal Society at the end of this month to try to kickstart that process. No, Nick is exactly right. I think it's terrific to get the scientists and the economists in the room. As a politician, I would say that politicians need to be in the room as well because we need to be educated. Thank you. The lady there, last question. Thank you for this uh, very interesting session. I'm Elisa Pornay. I'm the head of climate finance AFD India, the French Development Agency. Um, actually, when we talk about transition, it's all uh, about... Can you, can you tell us whom you're directing the question to? Um, maybe uh, Mrs. Tindall or Mr. Okay. Mr. Tindall. All right, Joe, so Joe, Joe will answer. Yes. All right. So when we talk about transition, it's all about economic model. And uh, sometimes we take as uh, granted that it's all about growth and a capitalistic model. So I'm wondering also if uh, we could consider this uh, just transition in an other economic frame. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Well, I think two things. Uh, one is that uh, um, it's increasingly uh, obvious there is evidence around the world that, uh, um, uh, Tom and I think you introduced the, the, the word opportunity. This is about opportunity. It's not about somehow sacrificing. So you can deal with the challenge of climate change and still have economic growth. Um, but the OECD is also looking at work uh, that uh, um, looks at different ways of measuring um, well-being um, and, uh, uh, you know, 
rather than purely from a GDP uh, point of view. There are other ways uh, of thinking about uh, uh, you know, the health and well-being of the planet and the people on it. Thank you very much, Joe. And with that, I'd like to conclude the panel. I know we are standing between you and a very appetizing lunch. So uh, with that, let me just uh, close by once again thanking our very distinguished panelists.